Good evening. Welcome to Chelmsford's newest public affairs show, Chasing the Facts. I'm your host, Sam Chase, and with us tonight is Susan Gates. Let me see if I get the title correct now. Uh, Executive Director uh, of the uh, Chelmsford Center for the Arts. So very happy to have you with us. Oh, thank tonight, you for Susan. inviting me. And uh, what we usually do is we start off and we ask our guests to give us a little bit of background, a uh, professional uh, biography and history in Chelmsford and so forth. So if you could uh, give us some insight along those lines, uh, that would be good. Sure. <clears throat> I moved here 32 years ago with my husband and our two sons. When my husband left the federal government, he was working for the Food and Drug Administration. He's a biochemist, biophysicist, immunologist. And he came to work for a startup in Cambridge. And so we looked around and we found Chelmsford. We found a house that we liked and the community that we liked. So we came here. But what I left behind was I had been um, in the stage management department for the Washington National Opera. I had worked in the off season for the Corcoran Gallery of Art in membership and development. And I had planned on going to library school, actually, as something to do as a, as a career move. But we moved here, and pro I, we moved in April vacation, and town meeting had just happened. And I'm from California originally, and I've lived in New York City and Washington, D.C. They don't have town meeting in those places. Completely foreign so, uh, exactly. uh, experience. So I had gone into the town offices for something. I don't know what it was, registering something or who knows what. And I saw there were the warrant books that were left in the hall, you know, on a table in the hallway. They were the left over books, ones. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I picked one up and I started thumbing through it and I thought, I wonder what this, this is really interesting. And I, I, I had a question. I don't remember what it was about, but I had a question and I called the town, well, he wasn't the town manager. I think it was the town secretary then. It was um, Bernie Lynch. Mm -hmm. And he he talked to me for probably an hour. He answered every question I had about the, the warrant and the, fin, the um, budget book. And I thought, oh, this is, this is a new thing. And he said, but however, you just missed town meeting because we had moved you know, here in April. So that was kind of my introduction to the town. And I, my children were in school and I was appointed to the, do you remember there was a rent control board? I certainly do. Okay. <laughs> and the rent control board's job was ju the only um, thing that was rent controlled were, were the mobile, mobile homes. Right. And they were, the, the Dakotas brothers owned it at the time, and they were looking for a rent increase. So there had to be a hearing to, for us to decide. Well, I was appointed, Bernie appointed me to that committee. Mm -hmm. And so we had a hearing to find out, um, you know, what should we do? Should we grant them their rent increase or not? And the way the hearing was run was really like, well, like what you see in Congress and, and, uh, when there's a hearing and mm -hmm. there, was, there was an attorney representing each side. And we went through um, asking all the questions. The two attorneys made presentations. And at the end, I said to the town council who was there, who, who wasn't the town council, it was like the junior town council, and I said, well, who's, who's writing the opinion? And he said, oh, I'll probably write it. And I said, well, why? And he said, well, I don't, you know, you guys can come up with your decision and I'll write it. And I said, yeah, but why? Why are you writing it? And he said, well, because I don't, nobody else knows how to do it. And I looked at the, we'd been given um, court opinions mm -hmm. by the attorneys for the cases that they wanted to, us to rely on. And I said, well, does it just have to be written like this? And he said, yes. And I said, well, I'll write it. And then if it's no good, you can take over. He said, okay. So we sat together, we came up with our decision. And then I wrote the opinion. I think I still have it. It was on a legal pad, you know, in handwriting. And I brought it back to him, and he said, okay, very funny. And I said, what? And he said, do you work in a law office? And I said, I don't even like lawyers. Why, you know, I, no, I don't even know. I've never 
talk to one, really. Now listen were, carefully, folks, because because they're going to something. To something right. Go ahead. <laughs> and so he said, um, you know, you should go to law school. And I started laughing, and I said, I don't think so. And he said, no, really, you should go to law school. Well, it turned out Mass School of Law was a new law school, and. I didn't really know anybody in town, and my children were in school, and so I thought, well, this is really interesting. So that's how the woman who said, I don't even like lawyers, ended up going to law school and becoming a lawyer. So that's a, That is a great story. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and it answers a question, because I always wondered uh, what prompted you to go into the law, you know, knowing about your your more of an arts type mm -hmm. uh, background in theater and opera and, and, and music and so forth. So that's, that's uh, interesting. Um, now, tell me a little bit about your uh, foray into the, into the arts in Chelmsford and uh, perhaps uh, your legal, uh, some of your legal work might have led you to that. Is, is yes, that, I, uh, well, <clears throat> after I became an attorney to pass the bar, I represented uh, artists mm -hmm. and writers I, I was working in trademark and copyright and that sort of thing. So I was in the arts world, so to speak. And then my hobby is, I think you know, music. Right. And so I was involved in classical singing. So when you kind of put it together, I mean, I was interested in the arts in general. My real, uh, my BA is from UC Berkeley, and it's a theater degree. It's from a department that doesn't exist in the way that it existed when I was in school. Mm -hmm. It was dramatic arts. So it was a theater degree. So I had that as a background. I had stage managed. I, I was in that world. So you put it all together and then you add the law degree on top of it. It's a good combination. It, it really is, I, I think. Um, <clears throat> now you, uh, uh, and of course, you uh, continued with your, your town service. You were uh, elected to the Board of Selectmen. Uh, I think maybe the second woman to be yes, elected? Yes, yeah, yes. Donnie, Donnie Toll was, was the, the first. first. Right. And actually, I remember that. I think that was in the mid-90s. Uh, you know something? I don't even know the date. And people ask me all the time, and I always say, oh, you know what? When I do something, when it's over with and it's done, I don't even... I, don't even look back. Well, you, so. you and I have something in common because I know that Dennis Reddy was the one who mm -hmm. kind of pushed you into it, and he he may have pushed you into it, but yes, he, he did. sucked me into it. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, uh, that's you know that that was Dennis, and uh, so you had a you had a term on the board, I remember, and you've been on and off as a town meeting representative, and and. Now you're I'm back, back, on, back on as a town meeting representative as a write-in candidate. Right. Well, <clears throat> and that was, I live in Precinct 7, mm -hmm. and Precinct 7 has always fielded a full slate. And then some. Right, exactly. Yeah. So there's <clears throat> always been competition. And I had been a town meeting rep from the beginning until, I don't know, for like 10 years or something. Mm -hmm. And I finally said, you know, there are other people that may want to do this, and I felt like I had I wanted to turn my attention towards something else, and people filled the gap, right? Right. This year, when I went into the town offices and they had the ballots all sample ballots on the wall, I always look at them just sure. to see who's mm -hmm. up, and I saw there were. Two regular blank spots plus a uh, write-in. I mean, a, a two-year, I guess. Two-year term, mm -hmm. unexpired, right? Unexpired. <clears throat> and I went home and I said to Derek, "I can't believe it. Yeah, Precinct, Precinct seven. seven, right? Precinct seven isn't full. This is terrible." And he looked at me and he said, "Well, why don't you run?" I said, "It's the day before the election." <laughs> <laughs> he said. Well, if you don't do it, then somebody else has a say. Don't you want to have a say? And so he knew me, and so he was egging me on. So I couldn't remember how many votes you needed to be elected. I thought you needed 10. We just changed that. Okay, but it used to be it 10, It used to be right? 10, okay. which made no sense to us on Charter Review because we were having trouble filling the positions. Right. That's why we changed the charter, so. But uh, that yeah. got by me. I mean, I'm old. Mm -hmm. I remembered the old thing. Of so course. I thought. So I said, well, I've got my vote and my husband's vote. If I can get eight more people to say they'll write right. in my name, then at least I'll know I have 10. But I didn't really expect 
that anything would truly come of it. <laughs> so I contacted those people and I put it on Facebook and I said, you know, I'm asking for your write-in and uh, Kit Harbison sent it out to some of her friends and I got 33 votes perfect. I got in one day. So That's I perfect. figured that was just fine. That's terrific. <laughs> well, we're, we're glad to have you back in the oh, town thank meeting. thank you. So tell us a little bit about the uh, uh, renovation of the uh, Center Town Hall, yep. as mm -hmm. it used to be called, and maybe uh, a little bit how that related to what was going on in North and how that, uh, how the Center Town Hall eventually evolved into the Chelmsford Center for the for arts. The arts. <clears throat> so, give us a little of that history. It would oh, be good. yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, the, since you asked about both buildings, mm -hmm. the North Town Hall was not functional. It had been pretty much gutted. Right. And it was sitting there, and there were people who lived in North who, and, and the rest of the town, but specifically in that neighborhood, who wanted to see that something happen with the building. The Center Town Hall, which is now the Chelmsford Center for the Arts, was a functional building. It was just hadn't, not much had been done to it. The Recreation Department and the Veterans Agent were resident in, that, in the, our building. Right. And there was even a, a janitor who was there and people used the building. Mm -hmm. the, the, con the concert band, the jazz band, there were meetings, all the groups that are now resident arts organizations for the CCA met in that building. And I don't, they didn't pay a fee because it was a public building that was, it's like the library's open, right. if there's a room open, they used it. Well, in the downturn, in what, 2008 maybe, that the, Regina was moved over to the town offices, the, Regina Kim Jackson, Jackson the, the, veteran's the veterans agent, agent right. mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. community ed kind of vet the um, uh, recreation was subsumed into into that. Mm -hmm. So the idea was they were going to close the building to save money. And, and at that point, hadn't the building sort of fallen into a state of disrepair? Well, kind of. Yeah. I mean, it was. I mean, it, it wasn't it, derelict, but it no. was. It was. It was. Going it needed down. help, yes, right. because nobody was, you know, if you don't right. use it and you're not, the, like the outside of it was held together, so it wasn't like mm -hmm. there was rain coming in or anything right. like that, but it had seen better days. So David Hedison was looking at buildings to build, to turn into housing. Public housing. Public housing, right. <clears throat> and he looked at both North and the center. Well. The center has a preservation restriction on it, but nobody was really remembering that. Mm -hmm. So when I heard that David wanted to go forward with it, I ran into Paul and said, no, 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 you don't, maybe you don't know, but there's a preservation restriction on this building and you, it can't be gutted and turned into something else. It has to stay like this. So Paul actually ended up renting it to the charter school for one that. year because the charter school was getting ready. They were starting their high school and they needed one year for their freshman class there. And then the next year they would open, they opened up what they now have in the old uh, Wang in Tingsboro. Right. And so then they would bring in, those kids would become sophomores and the new freshman class would join them. And that's how that they were in there. Mm -hmm. But I and other people started sort of rattling the tree there, shaking the cage and saying, this should be a community arts center. Now, that goes back to when I was a selectman. When I was a selectman, um, Peter Lawler was the chairman and he asked everybody to come to a meeting and have five goals. And my goals were, the rail trail, codification of the town bylaws. Do you remember they used to just be paper? I that, right? do. Okay. Codification of the bylaws, public parking, the library expansion, and the community arts center. So while I was a selectman, four were completed. Mm -hmm. The one that still hadn't been done was the community arts center. 
So I went and called a bunch of friends together and said, you know, we need to really lobby for this. So Paul ended up appointing the Town Hall Utilization Study Committee to look at both the North and the center to come up with you know, what, a recommendation on what to do with both buildings. And there was a meeting, and it was in the uh, auditorium at the Chelmsford Center, from now the Chelmsford Center for the Arts. And I just called everybody I knew and said, you've got to come to this. And I said to the artists, you need to be visible. If you have an, an artwork that's small that you can carry with you, bring it. And for once, they listened. People, somebody listened to me. <laughs> they filled the auditorium with arts. There were musicians. There was, everybody was there. And they had two easels set up. And they gave people post-it notes and said, write on the post-it note what you think each building should be used for. And I know that the North, they wanted it to be a community, a traditional community mm -hmm. center. And they, people wrote that down. But on ours, Every single sticky note, many sticky notes deep, said an arts center except for one. So that so said the over, that the, the overwhelming majority yes, said, right. let's make it an arts center. And, that's, and so Paul then said to me, well, I think you can do this, but remember, you have to pay all the bills. Now, this is a, more than a decade ago, mm -hmm. right? And I knew I couldn't negotiate with them very much more. And as my hand was going like this and he said that, I said, well, how much is that? And he said, he knew right away. He said $22,000 a year. And I thought, if I can't raise $22,000 a year to pay the bills, I mean, I may as well cash it in right now. So gave me the keys. We got together and I went to all of the groups that normally were in the building for free and had to convince them that that was then, this was now, and if they wanted a home, they had to be willing to pay something. And fortunately, the jazz ensemble, the community concert band, the Chelmsford Art Society, Toastmasters, I mean, those were the big mm -hmm. ones, they all, there was a community chorus at the time, and they all agreed to pay rent. Not, it's not uh, significant, but it's $10 an hour, and they have a home now. That's pretty reasonable. Now, uh, and of course, at, and at that point, now the renovation uh, okay. figured into that as well. And, uh, well, what, well, let me tell, okay, tell you ahead. briefly what happened there. So we, did, we started that uh, November 7th. 10 years ago, yeah, uh, 12 years ago, we did a ribbon cutting in the building as it was. Mm -hmm. Then in April, town meeting, we went to the town meeting and I made a report to say we're in, and we were in the black. We've, all, we've always yeah. been in the black. We've never gone in the red. I shouldn't say that. We went in the red on paper because I didn't realize that a deposit had to be made by eight o'clock in the morning on the last day of the year mm -hmm. and so it, Techn Technically, technical, it, it looked like the yeah, an accounting situation. yeah, an accounting yeah. thing. But we've never mm -hmm. really been in the red. Mm -hmm. We're all we've always been in the black, and town meeting cheered, and so it was right on the heels of that at that meeting that town meeting voted to use community preservation right. funds to restore both Total buildings, problems. and that's how that all came about. And that is a that's an entirely legitimate use of the that funding. In fact, one of the reasons why that particular uh, provision of the law was made to allow communities to dedicate a portion of the tax revenue, the real estate tax revenue, towards community preservation. Historical buildings of which the, this is both one, of, both, both, of both they buildings were, right. are historical, so they qualified. So now we've got a situation where we've got a renovated uh, CCA building. And one thing that concerns me a little bit, and I think should concern a lot of people, I think you've had a very successful uh, situation, as you've just said, you've you've never really been in the red. I, it's probably been close some years. There uh, was yeah, that that one know, year was close, but I know we you ran have, in. I know you have to deal with the uh, the electric heat. I won't go into that. that okay. No, but but you know what? That's important, Sam, yeah. because 
you know, when you, as you know, trying to project what costs will be, when people go, I want a five-year plan, I want a six-year plan, nobody, you can, nobody can really do that. You might make a three-year plan and stick with it. But no five-year no. or even three-year plans are left unaltered. Typically in, in business, you make a, a three-year plan, but it's updated every six, six months. Yes, exactly, okay, so exactly. That, that's what should happen. So yeah. in our case, the what was in the building when we started was a different, well, antiquated, mm -hmm. a different not efficient uh, heating and really non-existent cooling system, but there were window air conditioners and things like that. So once the building was renovated and new systems were put in, it, the cost skyrocketed to just for the utilities. And the utilities were more than $22,000 a year. So things change, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, if you, you say, well, you know, you thought you were gonna do this on a shoestring to begin with. Well, we did for those years up until the, reno you know, two years mm -hmm. up to the renovation. But once it was renovated, and the more the building is used, the more you have to turn on the heat. Of course. And, but you don't really, you don't see that right away like at the beginning, we only had a few groups that were using it. Now our building is pretty much used from nine o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night, at least five days a week. Mm -hmm. So it's so, there's so much traffic in there, you've got to turn on the heat, you have to turn on the air conditioning. Have, have, have your uh, rental fees gone up at all in the last 10 years? They've gone up on other things, okay. not on that, because one of the issues is community groups mm -hmm. like bands and choruses and you know that kind of thing. They don't have deep pockets. No, no they they're, don't. They're they're people like you know regular people who and right and they're regular people who want to sing in a chorus, mm -hmm. for example, and they may pay uh, dues of you know thirty five to fifty dollars right. for each one of them. But they're, they've got to pay a conductor, and the, they're, they're on a shoestring. Right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and so we're trying to provide, and I think town meeting wants that build, wanted that building to be used for a community purpose. I don't think there's, I don't think there's any doubt about it. And I remember the vote, uh, having uh, been there and seen your presentation mm -hmm. and, and, and so forth. And I think the town is behind you. In concept, but then of course now you have to, as you say, you have to book the acts in there, uh, and it has to be self-sustaining, and hopefully maybe maybe a little bit more as a cushion. Um, so, although your title is executive director, <laughs> I'm appointed by the sounds, town manager. Appointed by the town manager, which sounds very uh, highfalutin. Uh, highfalutin, <laughs> if that's the right word. Right. Uh, I wonder if people in town realize that you are a volunteer. You do not get paid. I don't get paid. Uh, now, let me ask you a question, and I don't know, I don't know the answer, so um, this is a legitimate okay. question. Uh, I, look at the, uh, I look at a similar situation in the town of Concord. They have their 51 Walden Street, which mm -hmm. used to be faux pack, and it's, it's kind of the same thing. It's a community building. They're, they're set up as a 501c corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, the town leases the building to them uh, for, for a dollar. But I know they have a Susan Gates equivalent. Yes. Is that person paid? Do you know? I don't know about them in particular, but I know about the other organizations. See, they're specifically a 501c3 mm -hmm. that their building is used by individual groups, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and they, I don't, I'm not sure whether they rent it out or not themselves to other organizations, but we're most like the Firehouse in Newburyport, uh, the Center for the Arts in Natick. In, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, amazing Things Somewhat, where, which is in the same area. I mean, they're in Framingham and Natick. Mm -hmm. They're in the same neck of the woods. The the uh, Parish Center for the Arts in Westford, all of those, everyone that I've named, they're separate nonprofits. The Parish Center for the Arts is a small group of people who run 
programming in at the Parish Center for the Arts, but it has nothing directly to do with the town. Okay. And the same thing with the firehouse, and the same thing with the Center for the Arts in Natick. What makes the Chelmsford Center for the Arts truly unique is the town of Chelmsford, the people through town meeting, voted to put their money into a public building for a public arts purpose. And I think that should be, Chelmsford should be really proud of that. And that's something Absolutely. we should be talking about with all of our uh, representatives, you know, our, our state senator, to say, this: the town puts money towards this mm -hmm. because we think it's important. And I guess, I don't know how much more time we have to talk about all of this, but. Well, uh, oh, close to four well, minutes, but okay. keep going. <laughs> so, one of the things people need to remember is that every single nonprofit arts organization, even the Metropolitan Opera, you can pay $350 for a ticket to sit, and they could sell out Center House, you could sell every single ticket out and it wouldn't cover the true cost of running the Metropolitan Opera. Right. It requires an influx of money from somewhere. You pick the pocket you're gonna, mm -hmm. you know, you're gonna, you're gonna go to, but it can't be done just on ticket revenue. It's not possible. And if instead of thinking about it like a business, we look at the library, we don't ask the library to make money, right? Correct. And so this is if people can kind of adjust their, their thinking a little bit, that may be helpful. The, the, I think the, the analogy with the library is a very good one, okay? Uh, but for some reason, I think people might have a little bit of a, a philosophical problem just making that leap to I agree. arts and because they tend to think, oh, well, this is performance, you know, we're going to watch a, a pianist or a jazz band or whatever or whatever the, the mm -hmm. thing happens to be. And this is something that, well, you know, some people think it's necessary, but it really isn't. You know, I mean, there's, right. all no, the, no, there's I, that, that kind of thought that, process. But I think you're right. I think in general, the people, the people in town support the idea. I guess I'm a little concerned because, and I, I hate to say this, but what happens when Susan Gates decides to leave? I mean, we've got a person who is, in you, who is a volunteer, as, as nearly as I can tell, and I try to follow it a little bit, it looks like you put in a tremendous amount of time in trying to manage this facility, get the, get the, uh, uh, perf the uh, performers in and so forth, and what happens when Susan is no longer there? That concerns me, and that should concern the town, I think. Do you have any thoughts on that? And you've got about a minute to, okay. uh, well, to I, talk about that. Okay, well, you're absolutely right <laughs> that that is something that the um, Board of Selectmen and the town manager and the FinCom and everybody needs to think about. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to how important does the community believe the arts are and this particular organization. And I would like to say, it's not just performances that people come to. It is a place where members of the community can come and express their creativity through taking painting classes, through participating in bands, children. We have three young people's uh, theater programs that are going on there. So we provide a place for the community to come and express their creativity. That's, and on top of that, there are performances you can come and see. And it's absolutely true. I mean, uh, Fourth of July, you can walk in, the doors are open, and you see the, right. the uh, display of the art, and it's just wonderful what some of our local artists do. So folks, uh, in the last couple of seconds of the program, I'm going to say we have to support the arts. Make your feelings known to your town meeting representatives, other public officials that you may uh, uh, know and, and, and talk to regularly. This is an important venue for the town. And I'd like to thank our guest Susan oh, for you're being welcome. with us and giving us a tutorial on the arts in Chelmsford. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect. That's a wrap. <laughs>